So I'm going to, I'm going to be speaking on end times, and it's a controversial su subject today. There's so many different ideas in the in the church about what's going to happen. Is the tribulation before the rapture, all that sort of stuff, and some people don't even believe in the rapture. But I, I'm going to do it through Bible eyes. I believe that what I'm going to speak is in the Word of God. If you have any questions, see me afterwards. Don't interrupt me while I'm doing this because we'll go all over the place. So uh, if you have any questions, save them up. So um, uh, the, the, you know, the first lesson I'm teaching on is prophecy. What is prophecy? And we're talking about end time prophecy. And you know, the definition is the purpose of God's redemptive plan for his people. The warning of the wrath of God as a consequence of sin of both Israel and the nations. And it's also history in advance. What's been prophesied is for the future. And, and that, that'll that be history one day. Now, God's word, you can only find accurate end time prophecy in his word. It's the only place you can find it, in the Bible. You know, forget Nostradamus and any other writer that bases his teaching on opinion. You can only rely on the word of God and that's where I've got my stuff, from the word of God. Now, there's a lot of warnings in the Bible about end time preaching and about false teaching. I just want to go through a few of these. In two, you know, there's a lot of verses I'm going to quote today, so don't try and write them all out, just write the reference. 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4. In the Amplified, I'm reading this out. To begin with, you must know and understand that, that scoffers. Mockers will come in the last days with scoffing, people who walk after their own fleshly desires and say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the forefathers fell asleep, that means they passed away, all things have continued exactly as they did from the beginning of creation. So what he's saying here that the, the end, the, in the end times, and we're in the end times now, the end times started on the day of Pentecost. And they will finish in the rapture of the church. We are still in end times. But later days, we are in the later days of the end times now. Like the end times have been going on for 2,000 years. But we are in the last, it talks about the last days of the end times. People are saying today, there is no such thing as the rapture. We've heard people say this. Or they say that we're in the in the tribulation now. Yeah, look at the, what's happening around the world. Or they say we've been through the tribulation with World War Two, and um, um, Alexander the Great. They reckon that was tribulation, and it was. And they say that Jesus is coming back after after the millennium, or the, or the tribulation happened in two in seventy A.D. when Jerusalem was attacked and burnt. So all they're saying, the church has replaced Israel and all the promises to Israel in the Bible are being transferred to the church. That's a lie. That's called replacement theology. So God still has a plan for the apple of his eye, Israel. He still has a plan for them. They are still the apple of his eye, even if they've turned away from him. Revelation 22 this is right at the end of the Bible, 18 to 19. It says, For I testify to anyone who hears the words of prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God it will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. So that's a warning to us. We're not to add to Scripture. And then he says, And if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life from the holy city and from the things within which are written in this book. That's a pretty dire warning. If you take away, if you, if you, if you say, I don't believe this, it's in the Bible, you don't believe it, that's the warning. God will take you out of his Lamb's book of life. That means you, you're going to hell. But, you know, that's a pretty dire warning, isn't it? So we've, we've got to be very careful 
when we're teaching and talking about the end times. In Mark 13, verse 32 and 34, it says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus, or the rapture, if you like. Nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It's saying that we don't know when he's coming. We don't know the day that he's coming. So, so how come some people can you know, predict a day and Jesus doesn't even know about it? Come on, folks. Yeah, we might know the season. Yeah, we know the season by all the warnings we get in the Bible, wars and rumours of wars. And we, we, you know, we can say now is the season for the end times, but it could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years, it could be, we don't know. It's getting close. But we don't know the day nor the hour. The angels don't know. Jesus doesn't know. We don't know. Only God knows. But one day he's going to tap the sun on the shoulder and say, it's time. And he's coming back. Hallelujah. So people have been predicting his coming for 2,000 years. You know, we're in this last age, the age of grace, the church age, and people have been predicting his coming for 2,000 years. There was a group of people in the States in 1988. That, um, someone wrote a book, um, 1988 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. And, and they all got together. And I know some, I met some of these people when I was in the States. And they sold all their possessions and they met in a big hall somewhere, I forget where it was, and they waited. And guess what? They're still waiting. And, and, and then this guy wrote a book, 1989 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1989. He didn't come, but it fooled a lot of people. People I, I know and I trust too at, at the moment, they change their minds. But Another game people play is to guess who the Antichrist is. And we hear Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Hitler would have been a good one. But he wasn't the Antichrist. Henry Kissinger, do you remember Henry Kissinger? People thought he was at the Antichrist. Ronald Reagan, because his name is Ronald, six letters. Wilson, six letters. Reagan, six letters. 666. But it wasn't Ronald Reagan. And the latest is Putin. Putin is the Antichrist. But it says in the Bible that the Antichrist will not be exposed till he has a peace treaty with Israel. And as far as I know, there's no one that's made a peace treaty with Israel, except a few nations have. Prophecy is not meant to scare you, it's meant to prepare you. I'll say that again because it's good. Prophecy is not meant... I'm talking about Christians here. It'll scare the world, but Christians the church. Prophecy is not meant to scare you, but prepare you. In uh, 2 Peter 1.20... In 21, the MSG says, No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of private opinion. Why? This, this is the Bible, this is Jesus speaking, uh, Peter, uh, Paul speaking here, because it's not something concocted in the human heart, but by the Holy Spirit, prompted one, prompting men and women to speak God's word. Now, that's a little bit hard to decipher that, but it's saying, when you try to interpret prophecy, you have to discern who the writer is, who is he prophesying about, Israel, the church or the nations, and the context in which he's saying it. Prophecy only has one interpretation. You can't take a prophecy and say, well, it means this and it means that and it means this. It only has one interpretation. So we need to be careful. Um, you know, you, know, you can't make up a doctrine, your own doctrine about end times and then try and find a scripture to suit your doctrine or your opinion. Prophecy is usually supported by other verses in the Bible as well. Now, um, statistics, it's, I always have problems prob prob saying this word, statistics. 27% of the Bible is prophecy. Did you know that? A third of the Bible nearly is prophecy. There are about a thousand prophecies 
in in the um, in the Bible, only five hundred have been have been fulfilled so far. So there's still another five hundred prophecies to be fulfilled. There's eight times more prophecies about the second coming of Christ than there is the first coming of Christ. So there's a lot of prophecies to come yet. Twenty-three out of twenty-seven books in the New Testament contain prophecy. This is the New Testament we're talking about. So one in every 30 verses in the New Testament is about prophecy. Jesus wrote a lot about prophecy. Paul wrote a lot about prophecy. 17 books in the Old Testament talk about the second coming. Now the first prophecy in the Bible is found in Genesis 3 verse 15, which is about 4000 BC. And you all know this. This is when... Um, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve sinned. I will put enmity. He's talking to the serpent. I will put um, enmity between you and the woman, and between your your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your heel, and you shall bruise his. I shall sorry, and I shall bruise your head. The other way around. He shall bruise your your head, and I shall bruise your heel. Now that was fulfilled in 30 A.D. So it took 4,030 years for that to be fulfilled. Jesus mentioned his second coming 21 times in the New Testament. God doesn't do anything about, uh, without telling us first. Did you know that? In Amos 3 verse 7, yes, Amos is a book in the Old Testament, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So God, nothing is a surprise to God. When something happens, it's already been prophesied. And he's, he's told us about it in, in, with his prophets in the Old Testament. <laughs> Jesus is the centre of prophecy. In Revelation 19 verse 10b it says, For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So prophecy is all about Jesus. Amen. Now I've I've got here ten reasons we should study prophecy. Ten reasons I've got here. I like lists. I've, I've always liked lists. I'll be, I, I'm an engineer, so I always have lists. You know, step one, step two, step three. And I've got here ten reasons we should study prophecy. The first one: it is the key to understanding the Bible. If you don't study prophecy, you are only studying 73% of the Bible if 27% is prophecy. So do you only study 73% of the Bible and leave out 27%? In 2 Timothy 3.16 it says all scripture, all scripture, not 73% of it, is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the key points here, uh, it says all scripture, and it says may be complete and thoroughly equipped. That, there's, there's three things out of that. So if you only study 73% of the scripture, you won't be complete or thoroughly equipped. So we need to study all the Bible. Now this church, we concentrate on faith in his word and they're important, but we teach everything else as well. In Acts 20, 27, Paul said that he declared that the, he, he declared the whole counsel of God, which means he didn't leave out anything. He taught, he ta taught a lot about end times. He taught the whole counsel of God, which in... Uh, Romans is, is the word of faith. That's the whole counsel of God. So we need to be teaching. You know, we, you know, we as I said, we concentrate on faith because without faith it is impossible to please God. So we need to please God. And we teach about his word, but we teach other things as well. And some people teach on end times a lot, but they teach other things as well. So Paul was saying that he taught the whole counsel of God which means the whole word of God. Now, number two reason we should be uh, teaching on prophecy is that everybody's talking about it at the moment, not just Christians, but non-Christians. 
they ask, what's happening to the world today? And they, and they see news on, you know, about China is going to invade Taiwan and uh, Ukraine, what's going to happen over there? And they hear all this stuff and they want answers and people are talking about it. So what is, is, it, is it a good time to talk about end times? Yes, it is. People say, oh, we're, we're damned. What will become of us? They, they don't know what's going to happen. They did a survey of non-Christian people and 41% believe that we are in the end times. 41% of non-believers. And 20% believe that the world will come to an end in their lifetime, like in the next few years. So people are talking about it all the time. A lot of people in the church are talking about going through the tribulation, having their heads chopped off because they've taken them or they won't take the mark of the beast. That's in the Bible. But people are in fear. The Christians are in fear. The non Christians don't know what's going on in the world. What an opportunity it is to, to preach the gospel about end times to them. The good news. The good news. The third reason we should be concentrating on prophecy because there's a special blessing promised to those who study prophecy. So who wants to be blessed? Who wants to get a special blessing? In Revelations 1, right at the beginning of Revelations, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those that who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now the Greek is in the present tense of this, and it's saying, we need to keep on reading and hearing and doing. Keep on. It's like Romans ten seventeen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. Not just once, but all the time. So we need to be reading God's word about the end times, studying faith continually. It should be in your, in your, um, your study every week. Number four reason that we should be studying prophecy. It protects us from heresy. Now, heresy is false doctrine. In 2 Peter 2, one, it says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be in the future false teachers among us. There's a lot of false teachers around. You get on YouTube. There's so much junk on there. I know, I know Phil gets on there and there's a lot of junk on there, Phil, isn't there? Because yeah, because I, I get on YouTube too, and there's so much stuff on there. This person believes this, and this. I looked for the other day. Yeah, yeah, can we talk about that later? Yeah, we'll talk about it later, mate. I just don't want to be interrupted today, if you don't mind. So there, you know, there's there's false prophets in the world. False teachers would come into the early church as they are doing today after Paul had been there. And most of his letters were written to correct false doctrine. Teachers were, uh, and, and, uh, and teaching about end times. In, in 2 Thessalonians 2, tells us that someone had wrote to the church in, in, um, in Thessalonica in the name of Paul. He said, this is Paul writing. And he was saying that they were in the tribulation now. They were quitting jobs and sponging off other members of the church. Sorry, mate, but I, I just want to get through this before I sort of go off on the track. So 2 Peter 3 verse 3 says, Scoffers were mocking the second coming. And I think we read that. False teachers will increase in these end times. So there's a lot of teaching out there, but if it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's false doctrine, it's heresy. So we've got to be careful what we, what we listen to and what we read. Remember the year 2000? Everyone's computer was going to lose all the contents they had in it. It was going to be the end of the world. There was churches on the Gold Coast selling tribulation food. I kid you not. There was good churches down there selling tribulation food and they made a lot of money out of it because people are gullible. The Mayan calendar in, it said in 2012 the world was going to end. Well, what is it now? 2023. We're still here. So there's a lot of false teaching in there. Nostradamus is a good one. In Matthew 24, 4, it says, Take heed that no one deceive you. This is Jesus talking. talking. Take heed that no one deceive you. 
For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. He says the same thing two more times in that chapter. Do not be deceived. Thank God we have his word. Thank God we can, you know, we can, you know, we can hear something and judge it on his word. Number five is prophecy proves the word of God is true. Hundreds of prophecies have come true. There's already, I think there's about 500 prophecies that have come true so far in the Bible. And, and the, you know, they haven't just come true by a bit. They've come true exactly how it was prophesied, how it was written down by the prophets. Isaiah 41, verse 22, 23. Isaiah is challenging the idol worship of his day to prove that they are right. And he says, let them bring, bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them, he's talking about the idol worship, let them show the former things as they were, that we may consider them and know the later end of them, according or, de, or declare to us things to come. This, that we may know that you are gods. But they couldn't do it. And Isaiah 44, verse 6 and 7 says, Thus says the Lord, I am the first and the last. Besides me there is no God who can proclaim as I do the things that are coming and shall come. A broken clock is right twice a day. You know that? A broken clock is right two times every 24 hours. But God's right all the time, 100%. Number six, it proves the person of Jesus. As I read out before, Revelation 19, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In the book of Revelation, we see 30 different names of Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords, and Alpha and Omega. I'm not going to go through the other 30, you find them out yourself. But it reveals Jesus all the way through the book of Revelations. There, there were 100... 108 prophecies fulfilled at his first coming. 33 in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. Jesus prophesied his own death, the day he would die, the day he would rise again, the destruction of Jerusalem, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the building of his church, saints being persecuted for his name's sake and sitting on the throne judging the nations. Jesus was a prophet. He prophesied a lot of stuff. In John 13, 19, it says, Now I tell you before, I tell you before it comes, that when he does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. That's Jesus speaking. Prophecy proves Jesus. The seventh, we've only got a few to go, so hang in there, folks. The seventh is it, it, it proves that God is a trustworthy God. He's almighty. Revelations, it, it calls him almighty seven, nine times in Revelations. He's almighty. He's almighty God. Isaiah 44 verse 6 says, I am the first and the last. Besides me there is no other God. So he's the beginning and the end. And he's in between. There's, there's no one besides God. He was there at the beginning, creation. He's going to be there at the end. All these prophecies so far have come to exactly what, what he prophesies. We can trust what he we can trust what he says. We can trust the word of God. That says all his promises are yes and amen. He can't lie. God can't lie. Number eight is a powerful tool for evangelism. Talking about end times, when the you know the late great planet Earth, have you heard that book? It goes back to the seventies when I was a teenager. Was I a teenager then? Yeah, I was a teenager, and I got stuck into that book, and that got me interested in, in end times. And also, in the last few years, there's been you know, the Left Behind series. Have you heard about that? Thousands of people have given their lives to the Lord because of those particular books. Thousands. So it's a tool that we can use about end times. You know, there's popular movies like, you know, that are made because people are interested in, ten, in end times like um, Armageddon was one. 
Is that, is that Bruce Willis? I think it was. And there's other ones. That, and people flock to those things because they're interested. And we can use the Bible, we can use his word to evangelise people. Number nine, when, when, we're nearly there. Number nine, it, it helps to understand the times we are in. You know, we hear, you know, we, you know, we get on the news and we hear all these things about, about Ukraine, about China, about, about what's happening everywhere in the world. And, we, we, you know, we, we get into fear. We don't understand it. It, it, it talks about um, troubles in the Middle East. That's going on all the time with Syria and Iran and Iraq and Israel especially. And um, Israel is, you know, the centre of prophecy too. A lot of stuff is going to happen there in the end times. Talks about you know, financial disasters, things that are happening, banks being bankrupt. Fancy a bank being bankrupt. There was one a few months ago. Financial disasters, earthquakes. There's earthquakes in divers places, in different places. Wars and rumours of wars. There's wars and rumours of wars all the time. So we, you know, we can understand what's going on in light of Scripture. But if we don't know Scripture, if we, if we don't know what's happening in the world, we just don't know what's going on. We're lost. So in light of Scripture, you know, you know, we hear about an earthquake. There was one in the aisle and somewhere the other day, and you think, ah, that's in the Bible. War, um, earthquakes in divers places. So we can help understand the times we are in by studying prophecy. Now this is, you know, this is probably the main reason why we need to study prophecy today. We can gain comfort and peace in studying prophecy. You say, what all these doom and gloom artists are out there? There's fear and doom and gloom. How can you get peace out of that? Well, my father, your father, God, wants to bless us. You know that? We're going to do a series on being blessed in the future. He wants to bless us. That's his character. His character is to bless his people, his loved ones. Do you think he's going to drag us through the tribulation with all, all the stuff that's going to go on? In the, do you think he's going to dra drag his people, Christians, the church, through the tribulation where the mark of the beast is and demons get let loose and the devil gets let loose and the beast and the antichrist and all those? It's going to be bad times. Do you think he's going to drag his people through that's not his character. That's not his character. In Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, going through the tribulations, no future, is it? And it's evil. So that, you know, that's, that's Old Testament. In, in Luke 21, verse 36, I'll just have a drink of water, excuse me. <coughs> In Luke 21, 36, Jesus is teaching about all the bad things that are going to happen in the tribulation before the second coming. So, <coughs> signs in the sky, distress of nations, perplexity in the sea and waves, men's hearts failing from fear and expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. The power of heaven will be shaken. He's t teaching all those things, and in verse 36 he says this, Watch the He's talking to Christians, the church, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. Are you counted worthy to escape these things? I am, because I'm a believer. John 14, verse 1 to 3, Jesus is talking about preparing a place for us in heaven and coming back for us in the rapture. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. And it talks about people having heart attacks in the end times. And I, I read somewhere there's more heart attacks at the moment with younger people than there has been in the past. Teenagers having heart attacks. It's all in the Bible, folks. So let not your heart be troubled, it says there. 
In uh, Titus 2.13, he's talking about the, uh, the appearance of Jesus as our blessed hope, not our cursed no hope. Our blessed hope. So what does that mean? He's our blessed hope for the end times. So we are blessed. Revelation 3.10, it talks about the seven churches. I might preach on the seven churches in the future. It's a good subject. And he talks about the church at Philadelphia that, that, that has kept God's word and have, has not denied his name. And he says, because you have kept my commandments to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the, the whole world to test those who dwell in it. So he, that church preached the word of God and they persevered in bad times. And he said, because of that, I will keep you from the hour of trial. The hour of the trial is the seven-year tribulation period. So these are comforting words. And we teach prophecy to us they're comforting words. To the world they're not. The world's got to change to come into the church. People need to give their lives to God. So don't fear or be dismayed. It says watch and pray. We, should, we need to be doing. Watch what's going on around us and pray. And that's and again, that's a continual thing. We need to be doing, watching and praying. So are you worthy to escape these things? I'll leave that with you this week. Next week we're going to talk about uh, dispensations and time periods. There's so much to teach on this. I, I, I spent all last week going through. I've got notes that thick. I can't preach them all, otherwise we'll be here till the rapture. Maybe we will, will be. But it, 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 it's an exciting subject. Amen. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your promises, Lord, that you have a plan, a purpose for us here on earth, Lord. A plan plans not to harm us, but to give us strength and to give us hope. So, Father, you are the blessed hope. And we thank you, Lord, for your return. We look forward to it. But we we sort of, we you know, we can't sit back and do nothing. Lord, you told us to go into the world and preach the gospel. That hasn't changed. To go and teach the good news of the gospel. Hallelujah. So again, we thank you, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that we can use what we've learnt today and what we know of your word to tell people outside about your coming and, and the blessed hope that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.